Is globalization coming to an end? World leaders at this year's gathering in Davos are debating ways to revive the global economic order. But after COVID-19 and with the war in Ukraine ongoing, how realistic is that? And can the geopolitical challenges be overcome? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. The richest and most influential leaders on the planet have kick-started their annual World Economic Forum in the Swiss Alpine resort town of Davos. They began gathering this week and so did protesters. <laughs> Now, they include a group of millionaires who want the world's elite to get serious about global wealth disparities. Other activists are demanding stronger action to tackle the climate crisis, including curbing the oil and gas industries. I'm here with patriotic millionaires from the UK. I've come out to join the hike and the protests here because we're in favour of wealth taxes. We really want to reduce this level of wealth inequality in the world that's so corrosive to society. You give your governments permission to tax you and to reduce your wealth, the governments can do much more useful things with your money than you can. We see that the WEF is inviting a lot of companies that are doing harm, that are not accepting human rights, that are doing their, that are violating the climate in different ways. Countries like Sri Lanka, Zambia, who are struggling in a major debt crisis, they cannot afford to come out of this crisis because BlackRock refuses to re renegotiate and to cancel this debt that is urgently needed so that we can take climate action and take care of our peoples in the global south. Well, inside and sticking to tradition, the WEF's founder and executive chairman Klaus Schwab gave the opening speech saying, Here we are. At the beginning of the new year, looking ahead to our future, characterized by unprecedented multiple crises. And even worse, those economic, environmental, social, and geopolitical crises are converging and conflating, creating an extremely versatile and uncertain future. It's no surprise that generally, we are all stuck in a crisis mindset. And that leads to short-term decision-making that may have long-term unintended damaging consequences. Davos should help to shift that mindset. Well, meanwhile, Oxfam has released a report to coincide with the opening of Davos. It says extreme poverty and extreme wealth have increased simultaneously for the first time since the beginning of the century. It shows the world's richest 1% got a lot richer over the last two years. They amassed more than $40 trillion worth of new wealth. Higher costs of living and inflation are making the disparity worse. Food prices are now unaffordable for many. Roughly 800 million people are going hungry. Oxfam is calling for the world's wealthiest to pay higher taxes. It says a 5% tax on millionaires and billionaires would raise around $1.7 trillion a year. And that could lift 2 billion people out of poverty. Let's bring in our guests now. And in London, we have Max Lawson, Head of Inequality, Policy and Advocacy at Oxfam International. In Davos is Shirley Yu, Senior Practitioner Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and member of the Davos Expert Network. And also in London, Indajit Palmer, Professor of International Politics at City University of London and author of Foundations of the American Century. A very warm welcome to all of you, especially you, Shirley, in a very chilly Davos there. Uh, tell us, what's the mood like? It's not a particularly uplifting opening speech that we had, Klaus Schwab, giving the sense that the world is changing and not for the better. We certainly live in an increasingly fractured world, and thank you for having me from Davos. Tomorrow, as a matter of fact, uh, the very first uh, session at the World Economic Forum is going to be a debate on uh, deglobalization versus reglobalization. China is actually underrepresented uh, at this year's Davos. 
uh, China is uh, one of the uh, major economic elephants that seems to be missing in the room. However, we're starting to see a lot of emerging economies that are coming in big time uh, on the promenade. Uh, we see Malaysia House, India House, uh, uh, the uh, Indonesian House. Uh, the, all of them are packed with people. So we're living in the interesting world at the moment. Just explain to us the difference between deglobalization and reglobalization. What do these terms mean? I think we have to re-envision globalization. What we have seen in the past uh, four years, four or five years or so, is this uh, comprehensive decoupling between the world's two largest economies, the United States and China, from trade to investment flow to uh, technology and essentially to rules and norms and values. And that is not going to improve uh, anytime soon. And so again, we are seeing both China and the United States are trying to remove each other from the core uh, quintessential uh, supply chains. The U.S. talks about uh, desynthesizing China from the essential technological supply chain, and China is talking about economic self-reliance, which is essentially de-Americanizing its supply chain. But at the same time, we're seeing the world's two largest economies are recalibrating their global supply chains uh, very much uh, in the developing world and overlapping. So I think in the future, we're going to see a different form of globalization with the U.S. and China at the center, and we are likely to see two parallel systems of uh, global supply chains and uh, all the other uh, multilateral architecture. Max, what's your view on this? A reordering of the global system is something that Oxfam International has long called for. I should imagine it's not quite in line with the way Davos sees the future, but what does Oxfam look for? I think we're looking for a more equal future. I think we're looking for a future where there is a lot less wealth and power in the hands of a tiny group of people. And yes, we're seeing some recalibration of between the great power blocks, but nothing has stopped the enormous accumulation of wealth, whether those are Chinese billionaires or American billionaires. So we would like to see a fairer version of globalization, which sees more of the value that's created in the world kept by those at the bottom and not captured by those at the top. And there doesn't seem to be much evidence of that yet. Do you think globalization in itself is a good system? Oh, we would certainly be in favor of a fairer globalization. We don't think that all countries can or should cut themselves off in any economic sense. But we do think the globalization we've had over the last 30 years has manifestly failed, apart from those at the very, very top. And we're seeing uh, tremendous hardship at the bottom. It's really hard to exaggerate. As Oxfam, we work with some of the poorest people in the world, in Africa, in Asia, but also here in the UK, where you've got millions of people going to bed hungry. Mm. That is not a system that is working for anybody. And I think the anger at the failure of that system is what's driving the polarization of politics and populism. So globalization has clearly failed. And if we're going to have a new globalization, it has to be very different indeed. Indajit, what does a fairer globalization look like? And can it realistically be achieved? I think that's great questions. Um, the, a fairer globalization is exactly along the lines that Max said, that in effect, you've got to go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that hyper-globalization has seen the rise of the transnational corporation to the center of world economic distributions and world economic power. And that power has effectively uh, been used in order to concentrate great levels of wealth and income and also political power and agenda setting power in the hands of relatively few people. And those sort of masters of the universe are assembling in Davos now. And uh, I don't believe that they actually have any kind of realistic solutions to the problem. And a large number of them probably don't even see it as a fundamental problem. So I think their interests are very much uh, kind of short-term, profit-led. A few look further ahead and look at the instabilities, the uh, instabilities of domestic political systems, uh, the tensions, military tensions between various strategic rivals, the militarization of uh, governments and so on, increased arms spending, and that instability that comes from that military competition. But I think most of them seem to be thinking that they're doing very well. They have large amounts of uh, wealth and power. And I don't think they're going to be fundamentally tackling any of those kind of core problems, despite all the kind of domestic and global uh, crises, which are kind of overlapping 
in what uh, people used to call a uh, hundred years ago, the Italian philosopher, Marxist, communist leader, Antonio Gramsci called it an organic crisis. Mm. It's a crisis at the very heart of that system. Shelley, is that a fair criticism of Davos or, or, or reflection of Davos at the global elites there, the masters of the universe, as Indigit calls them? Are they examining, are they aware of, are they discussing the problems of the bottom 99% of the world? There's certainly an uh, increasing disconnect here between the world's billionaires and the economic realities of the wide developing world. However, uh, talking about all the issues, including climate change, uh, poverty, elimination, and a lot of the develop development issues, particularly surrounding Africa, are very much on the agenda at this year's Davos Forum. Um, I wanted to say, though, uh, talking about the poverty elimination, which is, which is so much in the protest currently, over the past four decades or so, we are seeing China being the biggest variable in lifting the largest 800 million middle class onto the global horizon. And I think fundamentally, in order to address the poverty issue, development is really the ultimate solution. And if we were to look at India, a billion population, we look at Africa, over a billion population, we are looking at ASEAN, the emerging economies in Asia, another billion population, we're talking about uh, if we were just able to develop these economies uh, and uh, convert them into the global north, then we are talking about uh, lifting billions of people in the coming decades. And I think that is the fundamental solution to global poverty. Uh, Max, it's a fair point, isn't it? The current system has indeed lifted many, many millions, if not billions of people out of poverty. Is it not just needing to be a continuation or a reimagining of that current system rather than stripping it away and starting again? Uh, I, I think if you look at um, the distribution of wealth and income over the last 40 years, remember we only have finite planetary boundaries. There's limits to how much we can grow and keep our planet safe. When you see like 26, 27 percent of all uh, 26 cents in every new dollar going to the top 1% and crumbs going to the bottom. Yes, it's true, over a long period, you do lift people above the extreme poverty line. It means they're living on five, six dollars a day instead of two dollars a day. That is an achievement, but we could have done so much better if we'd had a fairer distribution of wealth over the last 40 years. It's so inefficient to give almost all of the wealth, and as our report shows today, two-thirds of all new wealth in the world has gone to the richest 1%, the people who don't need it. That is incredibly inefficient. So, yes, it, it drags up the poorest above the extreme poverty line, but enormous cost and enormous inefficiency. So I, I, I don't think more of the same is the solution. Mm. And I do not think that, as we always say with Davos, asking the arsonists how to put out the fire is a big mistake. These guys are the main beneficiaries of the last 40 years. Looking to them for solutions is, 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 is a fool's errand. But it is an opportunity, isn't it? And I, I'm going to direct this question back to Shirley. It's an opportunity for Oxfam to present a report such as it's done and present a solution as it's done, which is to tax the richest people in the world around 5% to create a huge fund that could then lift billions of people out of poverty. Davos presents an opportunity to present this solution to them. You wouldn't have it if Davos existed. But, Shirley, crucially, are people in Davos going to be giving it any credence? Are they going to discuss it? I think uh, poverty elimination and addressing the global inequality and uh, compounded with it uh, currently with uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, raising the interest rates. Uh, I was talking with a lot of scholars from the emerging world and they are saying, now we are facing a double-edged sword. If Americans are feeding the pains or the West uh, is feeding the pains of inflation, just think about the people in Africa. They are feeding the pain not only from inflationary pressure uh, that are essentially spilled over from the developed world, they are 
are actually uh, being, uh, you know, essentially they, they are facing a depreciating local currency as mm. well. So it's a double-edged sword. They feel so much more pain uh, in the developing world than the developed world. And so the, the, the voices here that are coming from the developing world are making it very clear to the global north that a lot of these fundamental issues need to be resolved. Will these global elites take seriously this issue of being taxed 5%? For that particular question, uh, we have to wait for the coming Davos week in the coming days to see uh, if there is any serious discussions about it. And do you, what's your feeling on that? Do you think this is a solution that anyone at Davos will be taking seriously? Should they be taking it seriously? Well, if you, well of course they must. They have to take it seriously. They should be taking it seriously. But the problem is that they are structurally embedded in a whole system of profit making, which is very short term and related to their own particular institutions, corporations and uh, and so on. And there's very few kind of, if you like, laws that you could pass at the global level where this would be, they would be forced to. So what Davos does is creates a forum clearly, but it's weighted towards people who can pay a membership fee of several hundred thousand dollars a year who have to then pay $29,000 to attend this particular meeting. Mm. A quarter of them are actually big corporations and their representatives. And you're asking them to tax themselves for the benefit of mankind. And when you look at the entire development agenda for the last 50, 70 years, they've been talking about alleviating poverty, alleviating hunger, uh, greater equality in the world and so on and so forth. But they have not really achieved it in, in any kind of great way. In fact, they've been failing at it all the time and the structural inequalities have continued to increase and globalization is at the heart of that. So the current form of globalization has had some benefits, but for most people in the world, it actually hasn't, it has made their lives are far worse. And looking to Davos and the billionaires who gather there and their corporations, I don't think, I think you may discuss some problems, but I think they're market led, corporate led solutions are very, very unlikely uh, to lead to any kind of solution to for ordinary people struggling in the world today. Max, the 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 uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he is at Davos. He's going to be calling, or he has in in the past week, called for the reform of what he calls the morally morally corrupt global financial system. That uh, this needs to take into account countries' vulnerability, and certainly in terms of. Uh, natural disasters that are coming fast and, and frequent with climate change, not only taking into account a country's GDP. I mean, this sounds like a great idea, but again, is it realistic? Uh, I think it's really important to grasp the seriousness of the moment and that it's not just ordinary people all over the world facing a cost of living crisis. It's entire nations following, mm. facing a cost of living crisis off the back of things they did not create. They didn't create COVID-19, which hit their economies incredibly hard. And they didn't ask for the, the spin-off impacts of the, the war in Ukraine and the spiralling uh, interest rates in the US. So I think you know, developing countries are already very, very angry after the insane vaccine inequality, which seems like a long time ago now, but in the memories of policymakers, they saw the rich world basically look after its own citizens and ignore everybody else. And now they can see food prices spiralling up. And as your other panellists said, interest rates rising in the US has a huge knock on impact on the cost of debt repayments for countries worldwide. So I do think developing countries are very angry. I think they want to see significant changes to the way uh, the global financial architecture is organised. And to see a situation where we have for the first time again in, in 10 or 20 years, and in the, for the largest extent since World War II, the World Bank has said that global inequality, that is the gap between the rich world and the poor world, is growing for, at, at the fastest rate that we've seen since World War II. So that's, that's why you're seeing this anger for developing countries. But let's not forget that it's also within countries too. So here in the UK, huge divide between rich and poor. So it can be a bit simplistic. We see the rich world as the bad guy, the poor world as the good guy. We're seeing elites all over the world, many of whom are at Davos, making a lot of money out of today's economy. So it is about inequality within countries 
and between them. Interestingly, though, Shirley, we have noticed that a lot of the political elites, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the UK, Joe Biden, the President of the US, even uh, Emmanuel Macron of France, are not appearing at Davos because to stand there in the face of people struggling in their home countries with a rising cost of living doesn't look great. Does this concern Davos as a forum and its future? Davos itself certainly as an institution has a lot of uh, issues to uh, to consider in order to have this uh, long longevity uh, in relating uh, to the most pertinent to global issues, certainly. But let me uh, allow me to explain this is the uh, the first time post COVID that in this mm. uh, depth of winter world leaders and the policy thinkers, uh, thought leaders are are appearing in Davos. And so there is certain um, amount of nostalgia, but there is certainly a lot of changes, as I personally observe in this year's Davos from four years ago. This morning, I attended a couple of uh, uh, events that are related to blockchain and the financial technology and very, very um, enthusiastic crowd, and they were asking questions about how uh, these uh, decentralized financial technologies are going to help address the uh, fundamental uh, financial issues that developing worlds are facing. And, and uh, really on promenade, we are seeing a lot of the uh, developing world presence and also a lot of uh, the blockchain technologies, uh, metaverse, and a lot of the disruptive technologies this year. So I think there are many, many aspirational agenda that are beyond uh, the political strife that we as a world face today. And we're seeing a lot of technologists that Davos is garnering this year. And uh, uh, these technologists, they are uh, really sharing ideas that can best not only disrupt uh, the West, but also uh, integrating the developing world with it. And uh, when it comes to political issues, uh, a very big agenda uh, at Davos uh, is uh, this fundamental debate about democracy and an autocracy. And we are seeing a uh, large delegation from Ukraine that are essentially participating at every level of Davos discussions this mm. year. And I think the West is probably going to show a further sign of solidarity uh, facing that are facing sure. our world today. Uh, Indiji, on that uh, note of innovation that Shirley was talking about, Davos having a great spirit of technological innovation, how key is that going to be in finding global solutions to global challenges in this world that is becoming increasingly fragmented? Absolutely. I mean, technological solutions to major problems like climate change and so on are, are fundamental. They're really important. But the key thing about technology, it's not a neutral force. Technology is in the hands of some people who own and control it, and then they deploy it in order to make very large amounts of money for themselves. And governments that, and use that and incentivize their companies to do those things. So the key issue then remains that although you can have new technology, just like you had new vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is ongoing, you saw vaccine nationalism. It, the key question at the core of everything we've discussed today, really, is who holds power? Who benefits from the structures of power at the world level today? And what we see is, is in the hands of very few people, but we also see at the other side of it, which is right across the world, we see people going on strike, people marching against climate change and the climate emergency and so on, people sort of fighting for their democratic and economic rights, etc. We see large numbers of ordinary people in various ways resisting this and demanding alternatives. And, but we see that governments are, uh, all the world over are not really listening very much. And I think they need to see in a way that their own long-term interests uh, are deeply destabilized by political forces which don't, can't live in the old way. And if the government can't produce and the big corporations can't produce, uh, then they're going to be even more political instability, political unrest, which may force other forms of reform and change as well, which may be um, very difficult to contain. OK, there we must leave our discussion for today. Thank you very much to all our guests, Max Lawson, Shirley Yu and Indajit Palmer.
and thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.